very welcome indeed to Maynooth University or to a location close to Maynooth University. My name is John O'Brennan. I'm the director of the Maynooth Centre for European and Eurasian Studies. It is also a Jean Monnet Centre of Excellence. And we are delighted to host this event today in conjunction with our colleagues from the Maynooth University Social Sciences Institute. This is the second in a series of Jean Monnet Centre of Excellence events that we're running in the course of this semester. We have further events coming up where the spotlight will be on Slovenia and a little bit later on Bulgaria, Bulgarian parliamentary election coming up, of course, in early April. But this afternoon, we are delighted to welcome Professor Dan Kalman of Rutgers University in New Jersey to talk to us about the rule of law within the European Union and the authoritarian equilibrium that has developed inside the EU, whereby national authoritarian governments have been accommodated within a European Union that professes to be deeply committed to pluralism and to all the values enshrined in Article 2 of the treaty. I should say that we're missing somebody this afternoon. We had hoped also to have Judith Sargentini, the former Green Party MEP from the Netherlands, who played a really important role in triggering the Article 7 procedure against Hungary, September 2018. Judith, unfortunately, had an accident and hasn't been able to join us. We hope that she's okay and that we'll be able to hear from her in the future. Now, in shining the spotlight on the rule of law and the degradation in the rule of law within the EU. Our speaker this afternoon needs little introduction because he's been one of the leading analysts of this problem and one of the leading critics of the European Union response to developments in Hungary, Poland, and in some other member states. Dan Kellerman is Professor of Political Science and also Jean Monnet Chair in European Union Politics at Rutgers. His interests include the politics of the EU, the law and uh, comparative political economy and public policy of the EU. Dan holds a BA in sociology from the University of California at Berkeley and both an MA and a PhD from Stanford. Um, he, his work, I suppose, has kind of traversed the divide of law and politics within the EU. He's written a number of hugely well-received books, including his Harvard University book, uh, Euro Legalism in 2011, which was the uh, won the best um, book award from the European Union Studies Association amongst many awards for that book. Um, but I think his most recent work on this extraordinary problem of democratic backsliding which is exemplified in his Journal of European Public Policy piece on the authoritarian equilibrium uh, is where we might begin today. And what I'd like to do, Dan, if we could initially, is to just flesh out what you mean exactly by this authoritarian equilibrium and how the European Union has developed in this way over the last decade or more. Sure, and John, first let me begin by saying thank you to you for hosting me and your colleagues. Um, it's a pleasure to be with you. I only regret that I can't be there in person, but uh, you know, someday uh, hopefully we can I'll be able to, to visit you there. Uh, but uh, yeah, on, on this idea of the authoritarian equilibrium, uh, basically I define that concept as a, a sort of politically stable equilibrium in which the EU paradoxically, uh, a union which purports, as you mentioned, uh, to support democratic values, require democracy, rule of law as um, uh, you know, features of its member states, that it paradoxically, paradoxically ends up supporting the endurance of autocratic member governments, right? And so it's in this equilibrium, I sometimes call it an autocracy trap, where it's in this situation uh, where it has um, it ends up sort of supporting the survival of these regimes. And the reason you know, I emphasize that it's an equilibrium or a trap is that we should keep in mind that comparative research on sort of federal or quasi-federal systems actually shows that it's quite common to have enclaves of authoritarian governance 
within broadly democratic unions. You know, the EU would by no means be the first sort of union to have uh, individual states that were autocratic. But for the most part, and, and that can last you know, for quite a while in uh, democratic systems, but th there are mechanisms through which they can escape that phenomena and sort of restore democracy. So my concern is that for the EU, because of particular features we can go into in our discussion today, the EU seems to be in this particularly um, difficult you know, trap where it, it doesn't have the kind of institutional um, design in place that will help it escape this problem. So in other words, it looks stuck with these regimes for now. Um, some people, Dan, are, make the argument, I mean, I come to this as somebody who has specialized in enlargement policy, and they make the argument that they should never have been let in in the first place, that Hungary, Poland, and other countries were admitted prematurely to the Union in 2004. Uh, certainly that argument is very common about Bulgaria and Romania. And there is this suggestion that the European Commission just didn't exercise enough oversight of institution building within the uh, then aspirant member states. So can we trace this problem sort of back to the modalities through which the European Union um, admitted eight new member states from Central and Eastern Europe in 04, and then another three subsequently? That's a great question, John. I, I guess the, the first thing I'd say in response to that is the, the way states looked at the time of accession in terms of who looked like they had stronger democratic and rule of law institutions, it really bears no resemblance to sort of who have ended up being the backsliders, right? So, you know, one, one thing to say to that is, um, you know, if, if you would look, let's say from the 2004 enlargement, sort of Hungary, for instance, was one of the kind of leaders of the pact that was looking quite good in terms of um, compliance with EU norms. And, you know, so, you, so even if they were applying you know, strictly their criteria at that time, you know, it turned out uh, to be ineffective longer term. So I think the bigger issue rather than, I mean, one can say maybe they shouldn't have gone for big bang enlargements. Maybe it should have been done more slowly, one state every few years to kind of um, be, be a bit more uh, cautious about it. That's, I guess, an interesting debate. But I think the bigger issue is what we can see clearly now is that there was a certain naivete about this idea. And we were all maybe a bit naive in the triumphant 1990s, you know, in lead up to the 2000s of thinking, well, once they are consolidated democracies, then it'll be fine, right? And so the EU had, you know, pretty tough um, criteria for accession. You can say maybe they, the, the commission didn't manage the process as well as it could have or something. But really the issue was that they didn't have a system in place for post-accession, right? They hadn't kind of tackled this question, well, what happens if uh, states backslide on these values? Now you can say they did put in Article 7, right? Which was the mechanism that's in the treaties that basically says, uh, if you have systematic and serious breaches of the EU's fundamental values, such as democracy, the rule of law, fundamental rights, then you can have your eventually uh, have your voting rights in the council suspended and other unspecified kind of sanctions. The problem with that is, uh, with that particular mechanism, uh, is that you know to apply those sanctions it requires unanimity, in, as people who follow this issue knows. And I guess a rule of thumb in the EU is anything you're serious about enforcing, you don't have the council enforce it, right? That so. You know, the, the idea that the council would by unanimity be the place you would go to enforce these values, that was always a nonsense. And if we go back to where this began, at least in contemporary terms, in the return to office of Viktor Orban in Hungary in 2010, and in Poland law and justice a bit later in 2015, Perhaps you could just describe to perhaps our non-expert audience the kinds of things that the Orban playbook, as we now term it, consists of, the kinds of measures that his government began to take to try and consolidate what effectively has become one-party rule. Yeah, great question. And I'll just go through that, you know, quickly. There's a lot of detailed accounts people can look at of, 
the character of regimes. But I guess the first thing I would say is to emphasize what not to focus on, okay? Because with uh, these regimes, a lot of the attention goes to their sort of far right policies, like on refugees, right? Or uh, more recently, let's say in Poland, on discrimination against the LGBT community. And these things are awful, right? But in terms of kind of consolidating autocracy, those are more the distractions, right? Just the way um, a pickpocket will like slap you or something while they steal your wallet, right? Uh, those are the distractions while they steal your democracy, right? In the sense, um, because the in terms of constructing one party autocratic rule, the real issues are the capture of the judiciary, right? Uh, so uh, that's probably number one. Uh, and there's different means to do that we can talk about. The uh, capture, at least mostly, of the press, so kind of eliminating most of uh, media pluralism in the country, and more generally kind of consolidating power, eliminating independent institutions, you know, whether that's election regulators, you know, kind of different watchdogs within government. You know, the goal is to consolidate as much power as possible in the hands of the ruling party, right? And you know, so those are some of the main steps. And then, you know, crucially, you want to try to change the electoral rules then before the next election. And I guess the last thing I'd say in terms of the character of these, and there's other things, attacks on civil society organizations, um, uh, stigmatizing opposition parties, trying to rob them of funding things. But I, I think the key thing for people to realize is we have to get away from any idea that there's just like dictatorship and democracy and these two kinds. You know, these most of uh, autocratic regimes in the world today are what are called hybrid autocracies or electoral autocracies, where they still have elections. They have the kind of facade of democracy, but they tilt the rules so heavily in favor of the ruling party that it's um, not fair elections, right? And you know, we see that in Turkey, they have elections. Russia, they have elections, and and you know the, the regime in a country like Hungary, it's a soft form of hybrid autocracy. And even with that, Dan, um, there are still signs of life in the opposition in both Hungary and in Poland. And we know that um, Hungarian opposition parties have won mayoralties, for example, in Budapest and elsewhere. Some opinion polls now are showing that an opposition that was previously extremely fragmented, which of course benefited Orban enormously, now may be cohering more. And there may even be a possibility of mounting a strong challenge to Fidesz in the next Hungarian general election. What do you think the prospects of that are? Yeah, so you know, the, the, the first thing I'd say is in these kind of electoral autocracies, right, the, the holding elections and going through uh, those kind of formal processes of democracy, that's a key element of the regime to kind of maintain the facade. Uh, but it, it also is a moment of vulnerability, right, where if even though the playing field is heavily tilted, right, and making it you know, nearly impossible for opposition to win, doesn't mean it's a hundred percent impossible, right? If everything comes together for them, if they can unite, uh, etc., you know, the, the, the it's not totally implausible. Okay. That being said, if we go to the specifics of the situation in Hungary, it's true that the opposition, spanning from right to left, uh, has come together. You know, plans to in a kind of electoral alliance for these twenty twenty two elections. So that gives them some chance. Uh, however. Personally, I'm doubtful uh, just because I suspect that Orban is not going to let himself lose. Like we've seen in the past, what he does is he uses his control of the election regulator to issue massive fines against opposition parties on trumped up charges in the run up to the election, do things like that. He, of course, controls the media environment. And, you know, so I would expect that he's going to try to react with lots of shenanigans, you know, in, in the run up to the election to make sure he won't lose. Right. But, you know, that being said, there are seeds of hope. I mean, on the phenomena of cities, I think it's important, like you said, you know, that, uh, you know, and some people would point at that to say, oh, well, it can't be an autocracy. The mayor is from the opposition, you know, an opposition party. Keep in mind in Turkey, right, Istanbul is controlled uh, by opposition parties. That doesn't mean uh, that Erdogan is not an autocrat, right? It just means that, in fact, it's one of the ironies in these 
kind of that you see in comparative studies, it's not only that you can have pockets of autocracy within a, a democratic union, but you can also have little pockets of democracy within an autocracy, right? That also happens. So uh, it's not cut and dry. Yeah. To turn to the European Union in all of this, one of the things that your work really importantly highlights is the, the extent to which um, EU funding has acted as a kind of lubricant of these regimes. And um, one Bulgarian colleague refers to the post-07 context there as post-accession hooliganism. Mm -hmm. And there he's talking about the wholesale ripoff of structural and regional funding by selected oligarchic groups that are close to those in power. Uh, this has been a marked feature also, hasn't it, especially recently of the Viktor Orban network of power in Hungary and the way that they have managed to enrich themselves extraordinarily, largely on the back of EU subvention. Yeah, no, no good deed goes unpunished, does it, John, right? So the EU is trying to help these, you know, uh, member states with structural funds, other, you know, agriculture fund payments, things like that. And it sort of backfires from a democratic point of view. The way I've looked at that is uh, kind of drawing on literature, and I'm not the first to do this, you know, in comparative context, uh, but applying ideas from the literature on the resource curse, right, which are political scientists in the audience will be familiar with, you know, this is the idea that in particular, like in petro states, you know, oil states in the Gulf, if, if you have um, a, a very uh, lucrative sort of resource, then that can actually not only damage your economic development, it can damage you politically and kind of perpetuate authoritarianism, because in, in essence, the leadership um, can sort of survive off resource rents, right? Rather than you know having to provide good services for the citizens, and also you know, because there's such um, you know powerful incentive to keep control of these rents, right? Uh, that you want to stay in power, and then you can use um, some of the rents that you peel off for yourself in corruption, etc., to perpetuate your regime, pay off your cronies, maintain a system of clientelism. Well, so when you think EU structural funds, think oil well, right? It's like the equivalent of a resource curse thing, because you have the money flowing in from Brussels, it goes to the national government, right? It doesn't go directly to cities and places, it goes via the national government. So they can use their control of the distribution of that money uh, to prop up their clientelistic regime of the party state and keep themselves in power, enrich their friends and family. And I guess the last thing I'd say is, yeah, you know, money, uh, when you're trying to deal with an authoritarian enclave, money can be a carrot or a stick, right? So it, this phenomenon of the resource curse has happened in other kind of federal type systems with uh, states benefiting. There's work on in Argentina on this by my colleague Carlos Carvasoni, old friend and, and others. But, you know, eventually it can also be a way that you can cut off the funds, right? And have leverage over these regimes. And that... Now the EU may be moving that direction with this rule of law conditionality regulation, but the problem till now has been, it's been all sort of carrot and no stick, or, or maybe that's the wrong way to put it, but it's been, it's been all the free rent, but with no threat of withdrawal, right? Um, that's a good way, I think, to talk about the budgetary process and the first real attempt to link rule of law performance within domestic jurisdictions to the subvention from uh, the European Union level. Now, last year, I think people were quite hopeful that this would be a strong instrument of conditionality and that finally the European Union had an instrument that was capable of changing the dial. Hungary, after all, received something like three to three and a half percent of its GDP directly in the form of EU funding. So, it's not that the EU doesn't lack leverage, it's been the unwillingness to actually use that leverage. But I'd just like you perhaps to talk about the outcome of that rule of law um, conditionality uh, move last summer, because it seemed to many of us that the German presidency of the EU Council in particular did everything they could to water down what were actually quite muscular measures and that in the end, we end up with a suboptimal instrument that may or may not work. 
Yeah, it's, it's interesting because, yeah, some of the you know, German diplomats or people involved in the presidency were trying to depict uh, their leadership as, you know, key to brokering compromise or somehow pushing these things through. But you're exactly right. In fact, they were watering it down and doing everything to weaken it, right? Um, now, let me just say a couple of things by way of background to this. First, I always was a little bit of a skeptic on this rule of law conditionality regulation. This is maybe water under the bridge now, but let me just bring it up for a second, because I my point was always, actually, you didn't even strictly speaking need it, because under the existing, what's called the common provisions regulation, which is the regulation of the structural funds in the EU, there was already the, it didn't, wasn't framed exactly about rule of law, so maybe it wasn't so explicit, but there was the possibility already to suspend funds if, for instance, a country didn't have adequate control mechanisms, you know, the anti-corruption framework was inadequate, and, and they had suspended funds on those grounds in the past a couple times, you know, to, I think there was once with Czech Republic, once with Romania. Um, so I think they could have done more with existing tools, but okay, let's put that aside. In, they decided to develop a new, more explicit tool, this rule of law conditionality regulation. The commission proposed it in 2018. It sat on the table for two years or more, you know, two and a half years. And uh, the original version was a bit stronger what the commission proposed um, because in essence, what it did is it said, yeah, if the commission detects a systematic violation of EU rule of law norms, kind of article two norms, then it could propose a suspension of funds, some funds to the country in question. And that would go into effect unless there was a super majority, what's called a qualified majority in the EU against it. Right, so the commission proposes it goes into effect unless there's a super majority to stop it. After all was said and done with the negotiations, uh, you know, under the German presidency, the main things they changed were they changed the kind of voting rule so that now the commission proposal only goes into effect if there's a super majority supporting it, right? So that's a higher bar. And the other thing they did was they tailored it much more narrowly. So you have to demonstrate a connection to risks to the EU budget quite explicitly to suspend the funds. And to me, what my reading, what that means, I still think the tool could be useful and I still think it could work and you could suspend funds, right? You know, and they could do it right away if they wanted. But it means that, let's say on things like, if you say the courts are not independent and those courts need to oversee cases about fraud on the budget, or if you say the prosecutor is not independent and he's politically captured, you know, again, then there's a clear connection to the budget. I think those could be grounds. Some of the other things like you're closing down the free press. I don't think you can use the regulation for that, even though that's a, a core value of the EU. The, yeah. the connection to the budget is very tenuous, right? So, so I think that's the things. And some of the like attacks on certain fundamental rights, minority groups or things like that, it'll be harder to make the connection to the budget, I think, on some of those. Um, that brings us to the question of the European Commission and its responsibility in this area. Um, there are lots of colleagues who have been, including yourself, who have been critical of the Commission. Professor Laurent Peck, for example, um, another widely respected legal scholar, um, I mean, he argues that the Commission dialogues with Hungary and especially recently with Poland, they have this sort of chimeric quality to them that we keep going round in circles and getting nowhere. And that a process that is persuasive rather than coercive is never going to work. And there still doesn't seem to be any real determination in the commission to move from the persuasive to the coercive. What do you think of that kind of argument? Yeah, I think that argument is exactly right. And let me just say something to start, which is you mentioned at the beginning you know, a couple things. You mentioned I'm like a Jean Monnet chair. You know, I have that nice honor the commission bestowed on me, which people associate with being, you know, big Europhile and, you know, kind of critics say, oh, that means you're kind of uh, just propagandizing for the EU or something, which isn't true. But, um, but, and then you also mentioned that, you know, I'm a been a big critic of the EU and the commission and their treatment of this. And I just want to say, you know, it's, it's a kind of, um, yeah, it's a difficult position for the, a lot of those of us, and I think you'd be one also who are uh, 
um, big proponents of European integration, support you know the idea of the EU and the process. It's been a sort of painful thing to watch how these institutions that we respected on many issues have really failed on this issue, you know, in a, in a very profound way. And yeah, I think when it comes to uh, enforcing the Article Two values, in when it comes to using the tools at their disposal, the existing tools. Uh, as forcefully and effectively as possible to prevent democratic backsliding and attacks on rule of law, the commission has been an abysmal failure, right? Um, you could say, oh, they've brought some, you know, infringement proceedings. Yeah, they've brought some, but they haven't brought many. They haven't brought them uh, as quickly as was necessary. They haven't done things uh, like, and as forcefully, they haven't done things like requesting interim measures. They haven't um, you know, done things like following up with Article 260 penalty payments for non-compliance. They've done it on a couple now, but rarely. You know, and I guess, yeah, a great example of that is something like the expulsion of the CEU, right? The first uh, university to be kicked out of a European country since World War II, um, unless you count Russia, but, uh, uh, and, and there, yeah, in the end, they won this case on the, you know, Hungarian law, but, like a year and a half after the CEU had left, right? Now, and the defenders of the commission will say, oh, these things take time, we have to be careful. Look, that's nonsense. They could be much faster. And my, look how quickly they are moving to launching an infringement against the UK for the breaches of the Northern Ireland protocol. You know, yeah. take them like two days or something, right? But yet they sit for years on these rule of law infringements. So it's not credible. I mean, I can talk about why uh, I think that is. You know, a lot of it has been political, Right, that the um, uh, first of all, in the case of Hungary, Orban until last week at least enjoyed the protection of the EPP, right, the European People's Party, which was his party, and that is you know, the party of Merkel and other Christian Democrats. It's the dominant party in the College of Commissioners. The past three Commission presidents have been e being EPP, right? So that's been important. But beyond that, I think the Commission has kind of become afraid of its own shadow, right, when it comes to enforcement on a lot of these issues. It it you know, doesn't want to antagonize governments in the council too much. Um, and it's just afraid to um, you know, assertively enforce EU law. And one of the ironies here, I think, is that the European Union is actually more popular in these countries than domestic institutions are. So sometimes the timidity of the EU, and we all understand why the Commission might be reluctant to interfere in national jurisdictions. Um, they've been very reluctant to interfere in referendums in Ireland in the past, for example, on the European Union. Um, but I think some of them at least came to the conclusion after Brexit, part of the problem was we didn't interfere enough. We weren't actually forceful enough about our values, stating what they were and um, committing to them. Um, and that brings me to a question about this imitative dynamic. I was struck in 2015 when I think it was Mr. Kaczynski in Poland said, what we want to build is a Budapest on the Vistula. And you could argue that that is immediately what they set about doing and that they've accomplished a lot of it over the last six years. Um, so I just want to ask about how important this imitative dynamic might be because we see elements now worryingly of the Orban playbook at work in Bulgaria. Bulgaria came in at number 111 in the press freedom rankings last year. It's just an extraordinary decline. Hungary, even Hungary is about 25 places above it in those rankings. Um, in Slovenia, there are deeply worrying signs that Mr. Jansha uh, is trying to move Slovenia in the direction that Orban moved Hungary in. Not at the same speed, not in the same ways, but there are elements at work here that suggest some of these lessons about how you actually embed authoritarianism in the EU model have been learned. And they go beyond as well, I think, to the Western Balkans, where clearly there are important links between uh, Vucic's organization and Budapest. And again, a lot of the same competitive authoritarian sort of impulses are in view. So does that suggest that over the last 10 years, you know, this problem is getting worse within the EU. We know that globally, the 
the problem is also very marked. Freedom House, their new 2021 report, shows another dramatic decline in democracy over the last year. So perhaps you could put some of that comparative stuff in context for us. Yeah, I will. Before I answer that question, let me just react to something you said kind of as you transitioned into this question, where you, you were talking about the timidity of the EU and, and also the popularity of you know, the EU and European integration with populations in Hungary and Poland. So let me just say something about that before I go to the imitation question, which is, because it really struck me, I, I think in a way the weakness of the EU's response uh, to this democratic rule of law backsliding is very tragic because in a way, if you look, and I wrote an article about this last year in uh, Politico with my colleague Jacob Saul, you know, it's been tragic that the EU is focused on intervening and been very in aggressive in intervening on kind of the wrong issues. So on austerity, right? And in uh, sort of budget conditionality, that sort of thing in, in terms of micromanaging states' budgets in the context of the Eurozone crisis, et cetera, there they were happy to intervene very um, you know, strongly. And yet on rule of law, they aren't. And that was like kind of the exact wrong recipe, I think, in policy terms, but also in popularity terms. Because in terms of turning people off the EU, you know, they didn't like that the perception the EU is kind of imposing austerity, et cetera. And meanwhile, what do all the pro-democracy protesters, you know, what, what's one of the things we see them doing in these countries? They wave EU flags along with their national, they're asking for help. And so the EU really is letting down its strongest advocates, you know, in these countries by not, you know, helping them defend their democracies. Now, to your question about imitation and the spread of the kind of authoritarian rot, look, you're absolutely right. I mean, the basic lesson is simple. Uh, appeasement doesn't work and it breeds kind of copycats. So yeah, Kaczynski saw what Orban got away with and that gave him the playbook. And as you say, the, the peace regime, when they came back into power in 2015, they set about copycat, you know, to the extent they could, copycatting the Orban playbook exactly, right? Now they're not, they haven't quite consolidated the one party regime, but they, they're using all the tricks. Now they're going after the media, Orban style uh, as well. Um, and as you say, it's, it's you know, spread further afield. We see you know, similar practices on different issues, merging Bulgaria, um, Slovenia, other member states. We can talk about the Balkans outside the EU as well. But I, I guess the thing I would say you know, beyond just agreeing with you that, you know, the, that uh, the failure to stand up to Orban has you know, bred copycats, the other thing to say is by not standing up to these regimes, right, they are able to then install their people and in, infiltrate the institutions. This is a powerful lesson from, let's say, the U.S. history. We had single party authoritarian regimes in the U.S. South for nearly 100 years after our Civil War, run by the Democrats, right? The Democratic Party, right, after the Civil War, um, uh, set about disenfranchising African-American citizens and creating these one-party states, which were not, you know, competitive. The Republicans never won. And, you know, it was similar to the EU in the sense they had a protector at the federal level, the Democratic Party who shielded them. But the point I want to make is this. Their representatives then became powerful in congressional committees, in institutions at the national level, if you see what I mean. And similarly, when you don't stand up to the autocrats, they then you know, get seats in key committees in the European Parliament. They get commissioners. Look who's in charge of EU enlargement policy. You know very well. It's an Orban crony, right? That he basically you know, made a deal with von der Leyen. I will support you for commission president if you give me a nice portfolio for my guy to, you know, have influence over enlargement. And the, the real danger for the EU with this spread of autocratic regimes is that they kind of uh, infiltrate the institutions and form a powerful block. So again, I often say on this, when people say, oh, if we crack down on them, maybe they'll leave the EU and something like that. No, they're not going to leave. That's not the risk. They need the money. Their populations don't want to leave. They want to stay in and take over the EU. Um, I think that's absolutely true, and I will come back to it. Just to remind our audience, we're very keen to bring people in. So if you have questions you want to put to Dan, please do just use the Q&A function, and I will filter them through uh, to our speakers. So you're welcome to do that. 
um, we are open um, as of now to, for people to do that. Um, a first question, and it links directly to what we've just been talking about. It comes from Francis Jacobs, um, who is um, a dear friend of the university, formerly head of the European Parliament office in Ireland. And he says, how do you judge the implications of Fidesz leaving the EPP? First on Fidesz and its friends, inverted commas, within the EU. Will Fidesz, for example, join Le Pen or Salvini? Um, he's been making noises about not joining the ECR, maybe forming some other larger entity with identity Europe within the parliament. So does he become the kind of fulcrum of this new, uh, impressed, you know, in, in numerical terms, important force within uh, the parliament? And secondly, Francis asks on the EPP again, will they adopt a tougher line now on rule of law issues or will it make little difference? Well, hi, Francis. Nice to see you. Uh, no more conferences these days, so I haven't seen you in person for a while, but great questions, of course. Um, obviously, this is very early days. This development just came up last week where they left the EPP group and looks like now it's just a matter of time till they leave the EPP party formally. Now, of course, it's Orban's goal or his wish to construct, as you said, John, or as Francis' question said, you know, a larger uh, a new larger grouping to the right of uh, EPP. You know, he announced that already. Of course, he's he's and he's in talks with Salvini and others about that. But of course, he's tried to do that before. He talked about doing that back in 2019, and it's hard to unite the far right in Europe for different reasons. Um, I, I'm skeptical that he'll succeed. I think the most likely is he'll join ECR. I mean, maybe they even like give it a new name or something to pretend it's something new, I suppose. But I think most likely he joins the ECR. I mean, longer term, there may be reshuffle uh, a bit where, you know, uh, so yeah, the, the talk is that maybe Liga um, leaves uh, the identity and goes into ECR if Fratelli d'Italia uh, is kicked out. You know, there could be some shifts. Orban, of course, wants to take others with him out of the EPP. Yansa, most likely. Um, I don't know, Gerb, I have more doubts. I defer to you, John. I don't know enough about Bulgaria, but you know, he, he, Orban would like to take more parties with him out of EPP. And that, by the way, is always something EPP was afraid of. It wasn't just they were afraid of Orban leaving and, and the seats and, and support they would lose with him. They were afraid of who he might take with him, right? So you know, now we'll see how that plays out. But I, I think um, in general, I don't think they will manage to create, you know, unite sort of all the far right in Europe into a massive new block. But, you know, ECR will get a bit bigger in any case. Now, on, on uh, the other question from Francis, do I think EPP will get tougher now on rule of law issues? Yes. I don't think their position will change overnight. But this is a huge switch, uh, you know, to, to finally make this move. It's long overdue. I've been a huge critic of the EPP. But okay, finally they're they're, they're doing it, uh, and so that's you know the right move, and that I do think opens up the space for them to take a tougher line, in particular on the Orban regime. And you you know you can see the contrast uh, because already EPP has been quite tough and issued tough statements about the peace regime in Poland. They never said things like that about Orban because he was in their party. But so now I'd expect they get tough on Orban. And longer term, of course. Um, EPP will want to cultivate a center-right member party in Hungary, right? So there's no EPP, I mean, there's this KDNP, that's just a fake kind of satellite party of Fidesz, forget about them, no, they don't get any votes really, but EPP will want like a real center-right party, so maybe they'll help try to cultivate that in Hungary. Yeah, um, I, I think this problem is not going away. Um, you mentioned uh, Jansa. Uh, in Bulgaria, it's highly likely Bajko Borisov will come back as prime minister. It may seem extraordinary that somebody who has just so recklessly managed the COVID disaster could be returned to office within weeks. Uh, but he's been the subject of protests from last July onwards. Uh, and I suspect there'll be strong protests uh, when people come back. But he's been smarter, arguably, in not confronting the EU so directly. Uh, mm -hmm. in the way that he's operated. 
And maybe that's the fear that there's a kind of insidious way of learning, uh, mm -hmm. partly from the way Orban has, what, he, what has worked and what hasn't worked. Um, I have another question, a whole series of them. Um, Anastasia Lacroix, hello Anastasia, welcome, asks, why is it so hard to unite the far right in the EU? You were talking about the ECR and Identity Europe to the right of the EPP. Why has it been so difficult for those groups to actually cohere and form a stronger unit? Yeah, well, and let me just begin by saying I'm not an expert on sort of far right parties. There are a lot of people who are more expert on that. I mean, of course, you know, while they have some common ideologies, there is something kind of in, there is an inherent tension in being kind of ultra nationalist and trying to kind of form an international political, you know, uh, coalition. Right. But I think beyond that, there are some substantive differences, you know, on things like Russia policy. So like uh, you know, peace is. Uh, quite tough, uh, you know, on sort of wanting to uh, keep a distance from the Putin regime, where some of those far right parties are uh, have close ties to Putin. So there's sort of specific policy issues. There's also the issue some parties, you know, really, even though they're quite far right in much of their ideology, they didn't want to kind of be connected with parties that specifically have a kind of neo fascist kind of tarnish to them. So, you know, the like Le Pen you know, her party will always be seen as kind of a legacy, you know, tied to fascism, where some of these parties, you know, try to build themselves as, okay, we're not, you know, neo-fascists, we're something different. So there's, there's those subtle, uh, you know, differences in history and in their ideologies. Um, so I think those are, you know, some of, um, you know, the, the differences. And again, that doesn't mean they haven't formed party groups, they have, but they just haven't united them all into one. And I still think they won't, right? Yeah, um, we have a question from Shona Murray of Euro News. Welcome, Shona. Um, she asks again about the rule of law conditionality linkage. And um, if the EU, in a sense, doesn't get on top of these things, how much will the vast amounts in the rescue fund, in the EU recovery fund, help Orban Jansa, uh, Kaczynski and so on, solidified control. So I guess there's another question here, which is about COVID and whether it has also offered the opportunity to some of these regimes under cover of the emergency to deepen their hold over domestic institutions. So two parts to that question. Uh, all right, so great question. I mean, first on the... Um you know, on the money. Yeah, so if we if we start with this uh, sort of resource curse idea that I introduced, well, of course, if you then add, uh, you know, a few couple trillion more, right, then that's a huge new pot of money, uh, which, again, it's not saying all of it is stolen, right? They're going to give it out for sort of the stated purposes. But as long as you can skim some of it or direct you know, contracts for construction and different things like that to your cronies, then you get the political benefit we were talking about. So of course, the stakes were raised, well, both because there was just a new budget, the seven-year multi-annual financial framework, and because there was this separate pot of the, the uh, recovery fund. And, and by the way, you know, I think it extends to other things. Once you studied these regimes and this exploitation of money and see it through that lens, you see things differently. Like, let's say like the Green New Deal, your European Green Deal. Okay, great idea. But when I like read about that, I start thinking, okay, well, probably, you know, cronies of Orban are going to go into the windmill business, basically, right? That That's going to, whenever you see a pot of money, you know that that's what they're going to be angling for. So I do think, um, and by the way, hello, Shona, nice to, you're joining us, haven't talked to you for a while, um, that I, I think it's crucial, given the new influx of money, that the commission actually use this rule of law conditionality mechanism and actually trigger it and show that it means business to discourage, not just to discourage Orban, you know, for, but also then to send a signal to others, right, about um, this. And on the second question of, yeah, just kind of COVID, well, certainly, you know, this is one of the oldest stories in the book about kind of the slide to autocracy is the exploitation of emergencies, right, the famous Reichstag fire kind of uh, logic. And as we know, for instance, in Hungary, right, they used COVID to kind of, um, as a justification to 
uh, declare this kind of new state of emergency where they could rule by decree and um, suspending even, you know, what little power, you know, parliament had vis-a-vis um, -vis the government as it was. So, uh, and I think more generally, there's actually, for those interested, there's a terrific compendium on um, this website for Fassung's blog, right? Uh, that was put together by uh, Joel Grogan from uh, Middlesex University, London, uh, an incredible project where she really looked across a uh, huge number of countries at how they were exploiting the COVID crisis uh, for sort of different forms of uh, rule of law, you know, threats to the rule of law. Yeah. I, I, highly, I highly recommend Verfassen's blog. Uh, I recommend my students read it. And you know, the contributions are so rich and so varied. It's an extraordinary site and one of great excellence. Um, another question from Jim Carroll, who I think might be Jim Carroll from RTE Brainstorm. He asks, have lessons been learned from Franz Timmermans' experience of trying to tackle these issues, by which I think he might mean the opening of the Article 7 procedure against Poland. It maybe offers us an opportunity to just go a little deeper into that area. Many people argue that Article 7 is, in effect, inoperable. Uh, mm -hmm. at 7.3 in particular is the nuclear button of sanctions and the first time that this was even attempted which was back in 2000 when people may remember the Haidar uh, Freedom Party in Austria the prospect of it going into coalition with Austria and it was a complete disaster first time round. Um, so perhaps you could just comment then on the uh, Article 7 procedure against Poland and what has or hasn't happened. All right. So an Article 7, and, and first, you know, Article 7 has been triggered against both uh, Poland and Hungary. Interestingly, though, the commission triggered it against uh, Poland, and it was only the parliament that triggered it against Hungary, once again showing the difference in treatment uh, by the commission of Hungary and Poland because Hungary enjoyed the protection of the EPP. I, that's what I would attribute it to. But that being said, you know, both have been triggered. I think the current state is, I mean, first, it's true that to, to get to the phase where you issue could issue any sanctions, you have to go through a, a stage where you need a unanimous agreement in the council other than the offending state. Now, of course, now with two states, Hungary and Poland, uh, you know, they, they've vowed to protect each other and veto action that would require unanimity. Now, there is an interesting argument that uh, my friend and colleague Kim Shepala from Princeton University made a couple of years ago in an article in Politico, which he sort of argued, well, there, there could be an argument that, um, you know, it's not there in the text, but I think one could argue uh, for an exception that says, well, if a state is subject to Article 7, it shouldn't be able to veto a different Article 7 against another state. So in other words, your kind of veto right should be suspended, right? And, you know, they could try that. I bet it would work for the ECJ. But I think the problem is beyond that, honestly, because I don't think it's only Poland and Hungary, right? For instance, I think Slovenia would, you know, and Jansa would veto action. So there, there's others. Okay, so to take a step back, my point would be Article 7 is not going to work. It's a dead letter. We can forget about Article 7. Article 7 might work if some leader decided to kind of go full bore, violent autocracy, Belarus style or something. But so long as they do this hybrid autocracy where you kind of, you know, shut down newspapers rather than arresting the reporters, that sort of thing, Article 7 will never be triggered. So we might as well forget about it. And I think the current status is. Because, you know, they're, they're like the Portuguese presidency has said they're not even going to hold hearings. They're making excuses about COVID, et cetera. But I think the truth is that right now, even states who want the EU to get tougher on Hungary and Poland, their view is, well, we can never get unanimity. So actually, let's not push this thing, because what if it was, was pushed to a vote and we lost? Then that would look bad, like it would look like they're innocent. So they just want to leave it in limbo, right? Like this permanent kind of purgatory uh, or, you know, this kind of sword hanging over Hungary and Poland, that Article 7 has been opened against you. So that means, you know, we're, we're watching you, right? But they don't actually want to push it for a vote. So I think that's kind of where we are with Article 7, and it will kind of remain in a limbo. 
And if we want any action, it's got to be using other tools, not Article 7, but other tools. Um, another question from Olivier Simai. Apologies if I have got your surname wrong, Oliver. Um, he is a final year law student at KU Leuven in Belgium. And a specific question about the rule of law regulation uh, that was voted in December. The mechanism is weakened, he argues, and the council conclusion has made sure that it won't be used for another two years at least uh, when the court will have rendered a judgment, perhaps. Uh, the commission has already announced that it will retroactively use the mechanism when approved, but um, Olivier's question is about the specific clause that was inserted in the regulation to protect individuals, so that if a part of the budget is revoked under the regulation, that citizens are still protected. What is your view, he asks, of this clause? How should it work? And can the targeted member state hide behind this clause by stating that the money is already allocated to individuals? Okay, well, nice to hear from you. Um, Le Leuven has a special place in my heart. My niece and nephew are students there and I was married there. Uh, so nice to hear from a student in Leuven. But uh, I would say this, um, first of all, just on the council conclusions were illegal and they're not worth the paper they were written on, right? They have no binding effect. Uh, and the only ridiculous thing is that neither the parliament nor the commission uh, are challenging them. The commission did uh, issue some statement kind of saying these, you know, aren't binding on us, but basically like no one's challenging them legally. They're just trying to, you know, sort of pretend they're not there. But that being said, the commission has kind of said, well, yeah, we are not, we're not going to trigger this until we've issued guidelines and yeah, sort of uh, wait to see the outcome of this court case. They shouldn't be doing that. They could trigger the, the rule of law conditionality regulation today. It's good law. It's, you know, it's a valid regulation. It can be triggered today. Okay, that being said, the reality is they're gonna wait and stall. Now on this issue of you know, protecting the financial interests of individuals, I wasn't a big fan of that provision. The, the MEPs put that in there. You know, they em emphasize it because they said, well, we don't want you know, citizens to be hurt. We don't want beneficiaries of the EU budget. Um, so I can understand why they did it, uh, but I wasn't a fan of that provision, but I don't think that governments can hide behind it the way you said, because the idea really is that uh, you, the government, are still on the hook to pay out you know, what's been committed right, uh, to uh, these individuals. So if we suspend your funds, the idea is your EU funds, you should come up with that money out of your own tax revenue, right, in essence. So it's not designed to be a way to avoid applying the regulation or, right, it's designed to be a way to say, well, it's you, the government, who will be hurt, but not the individuals. Now, um, a very good question here uh, from uh, Henri Koblitschke. And Henri says, what can we learn from cases beyond the poster children for competitive authoritarianism in Poland and Hungary? Can we learn anything, he asks, from Romania? And he reminds us, of course, that this isn't just about the EPP. In the Romanian case, it was the return of Ceausescu's party, in a sense, the PSD. When they came back to power, they began to uh, try to unravel all of the sort of measures that had been put in place uh, that had helped uh, eventually make Rom Romanian politicians accountable including some of them going to prison. Um, what can we learn from the Romanian case, he argues, um, where effectively it was domestic action that pushed the PSD out of government? Mm -hmm. I, look, I think we can learn a lot from the Romanian and from all these cases and comparing them. Here's a few thoughts I have on that. So it's, uh, I appreciate the question. First, it's important to emphasize it's not just the EPP. You know, I, I call these kind of parties um, that get political protection from their Euro party, right? These kind of autocratic leaning parties, I call them pet autocrats, right? And basically all the Euro parties have pet autocrats, except for the Greens, so far as I know. They're innocent, right? But the others all have some, you know, very problematic member party um, that we, 
that maybe they, they don't run a government, so they're not, let's say, an autocrat yet, but their kind of platform, their behavior, their agenda, you know, pursues that. So the socialists, um, you know, you had the government in Malta, right? And then, and as you say, in Romania, um, and, um, you know, in Dragnia, who's, I guess he's in jail now, right? Um, but what I would say is this, the whole episode, when they had the constitutional crisis, and I'm not an expert on Romania, I just rely on, you know, work I read by colleagues who know the case better, Vlad Perju and others. But, um, you know, I think what we see in the Romania, which was interesting, is that, well, yeah, it showed that there was a problematic member party that was in the, the socialist and Democrat group. And they, they were softer on that government than the parties of the right were. That's true. One thing to say there is that it was striking that uh, Barroso intervened more forcefully vis-a-vis -vis what was happening in Romania than he did in Hungary, which is consistent with my thesis about kind of party politics. Hungary was in his party, Romania on the other side. Um, and so I think we see that. I also think, though, even though everyone has pet autocrats, not all the parties have been equally sort of reluctant to stand up to them at all. So I think the left, and there's a research, there's a nice article, I forget which journal, by Ulrich Zedelmeier, which kind of makes this point that, yeah, the parties of the right have been a bit softer on their pet autocrats, whereas, the, um, let's say, the socialists, although they've been more favorable to them, they've maybe eventually stood up to them, which we saw, you know, more criticism of the Romanian party by the Euro socialists. Yeah. The Romanian case also throws up another really interesting uh, question, I think, and that is the role of domestic prosecutors in these jurisdictions. Because in Romania, it was Laura Cudreta Covesi who really made her name as somebody who put the fear of God into these oligarchs and politicians. And she did succeed in putting quite a number of them in prison. She now takes up the post of European public prosecutor. And I guess the question, Dan, is, does the introduction of this new institution potentially change anything in this sphere in the years to come? Well, there's a bit of a problem with it, right? Which is it's subject to differentiated integration, which means Hungary and Poland didn't join it. So, Bulgaria you know, is, though, interesting. Yeah, sorry? Bulgaria is signed up. Yeah. Which is interesting. Yeah, which is encouraging. Look, I think the EPPO is a good development, right? Um, you know, there's some promise there for sure. Uh, it's been underfunded, right? It doesn't have resources, staffing it needs. There's also been some controversy surrounding some of the appointments, which is, uh, you know, worrying uh, in terms of kind of, let's say, too much political influence, uh, you know, over the appointments, you know, because we precisely want, as you say, independent prosecutors. But I think it's definitely you know, a promising development. I think to me though, yeah, one of the most striking things, I j just think about the contrast to, let's say, you know, issues to do with the bailouts in the Eurozone crisis. There, there's always been this principle, if you want to get bailout money, then you have to, you know, sign on to whatever, like the fiscal compact treaty, right? So you have to follow the rules if you want the money. That's what they do in the kind of austerity and, you know, budget rate. But when it comes to rule of law, and you know the EU budget and fraud against it. There, you can opt out of the EPPO, right? Uh, and yet, you still have the flow of structural funds, right? Um, I have another very, very good question, um, which brings the UK into all of this. Uh, people might wonder how or why. Uh, Colin Gordon from Oxford in the UK says, "Dan, you are running a superb Twitter mega thread." Uh, yeah, that is true, folks. If you haven't seen it, it's a sight to believe. Now up to almost two hundred and fifty different more, more, more. Okay, you can explain. It. But the question is, how far do you see the progress of the UK Brexit regime, as Colin puts it, as paralleling many traits of the Orban playbook? Both, he says, inspired by a Russian hegemon and sponsor. <laughs> So are these two different, but in, in some ways, similar variants of attacks on the European Union model? Yeah, well, I mean, obviously UK no longer a member state. So it's, let me just say one background thing, just so everyone realizes, I mean, one of the few uh, benefits of Brexit, uh, you know, which I think was 
you know, hugely harmful to the UK in particular, and it's a terrible idea and all the problems with the Irish uh, border in Northern Ireland. But one of the few benefits is that uh, when the Tories, you know, when the UK was in, the Tories were the biggest party in the ECR group and were a big protector of peace, right? So whereas like the CDU is criticizing the, P, uh, you know, the PIS regime in Poland because they weren't in their party, the Tories were defending them, right? So in the kind of counterfactual world where the, you know, let's say they, they were still in the EU, while many things would have been better, one kind of problem would be that they would probably have been, you know, defending these regimes, which brings to us to the, the question, um, you know, are there parallels between what's happening uh, in the UK? And I think, yeah, I think there are uh, in the sense that, you know, we see out of uh, the Johnson government you know, obviously he's got, he's a sort of populist and using a, a lot of the language and techniques of populism, but also with a lot of the attacks you, you've heard about judges, you know, all throughout the Brexit process, you know, we can remember, I don't know if it was the, I think it was actually the Telegraph, so not just the Daily Mail, but the Telegraph, you know, having pictures of judges and sort of with this, people. Yeah, enemies of the people language, et cetera. So you, you see some of these moves um, to uh, sort of, centralize power even further um, to shield it from accountability to judiciary. So I, I think, you know, there, there's worries. You know, hopefully the UK won't go too far down that path, but, you know, we all, those who study comparative politics, we kind of realize that the institutional setup of the UK is like ideal for someone who would want to backslide on democracy and the rule of law because of the way the Westminster system kind of consolidates power and doesn't have so many checks and balances. So the fact that UK democracy has survived as long as it has in ways a testament to some values or something, because it wasn't because they had good institutions, right? Um, I mean, that's as much as I can say there. I just, on the Twitter thread, I, I guess I would say, yeah, I've just, since you mentioned that, John, I don't know, I started this thing where I was just tracking stories about, in particular, economic damage to the different sectors in the UK from Brexit. Um, I mean, I don't pay the license fee living in the US, so I don't know what's happening on British TV, but it was my impression it's not getting that much coverage, even though, you know, it's in, you know, The Guardian and in the FT, but, you know, there's not uh, a huge amount of attention because of COVID and other things and, um, you know, Harry, Megan and whatnot. Uh, and, and so I'm just trying to track these stories and it's, it's incredible, yeah, how many stories are coming out about individual businesses being destroyed, et cetera. Yeah, and of course, it's also that the UK government has been willing to actually break solemn uh, international law and domestic law in order to do the things it wants to do, whether it was the internal market bill in back in the autumn or uh, in the last week or so, this unilateral move against the uh, TCA. Um, mm -hmm. A good question going back to Hungary comes from Blair Horan. Blair is one of Ireland's most senior trade union leaders. And he asks, to what extent, if any, does Orban's move to give voting rights to the Hungarian population in other states, uh, principally Romania, big proportion of the Romanian population lives there as a result of the Trianon Treaty uh, more than a hundred years ago. How much of that, uh, that kind of populism accounts for Orban's continuing popularity in Hungary? I, I'm glad you brought up that question because actually in our discussion of my authoritarian equilibrium, we kind of didn't go through the whole thing or I didn't, you know, systematically. And, you know, there I talk about sort of three main factors that help perpetuate this situation in the EU. One being the party politics, which we've talked about where these Euro parties protect their pet autocrats. Uh, second one being the EU money, which we've talked about and how it finances these regimes uh, and also EU kind of investment. But the final one, this question gets at, which is, um, I'm just gonna expand a little bit beyond the question, but I'll also address it, which is, you know, I talk about how emigration, so the, the exodus of people, right? Coupled with kind of the EU's approach to how it regulates voting rights and that sort of thing helps these regimes survive. So my main point there is like, let's say in Hungary, since Orban's taken over, there's been a huge exodus, uh, a, a very rapid increase in the number of Hungarians moving to other EU member states, okay? And 
here's the, the voting key. The, those people tend to be disproportionately young and well-educated and likely opposition voters. But here's the rub, and here's why it's an authoritarian equilibrium. When Hungarians move to other EU member states, they don't. They can vote in local elections and European Parliament elections, but they can't vote in national elections. Or let me rephrase: they can vote in national elections back home, but only under conditions set by the Orbán regime, right? And this applies to other Bulgaria, other states too. So here now, I'll finally answer the question. The irony is in the EU system: if you're a Hungarian who has moved to Germany, let's say for work or Austria, the government makes it very hard for you to vote in Hungarian national elections. And we're talking hundreds of thousands of people here, right? They make it very hard. You have to go to a consulate or embassy and vote in person. You can't just do it by mail, et cetera. So they, and in the end, only like 10% of those people or so vote, right? So basically 90% of them are lost. And meanwhile, exactly as the questioner puts it, um, Orban, can end, so he's kind of effectively disenfranchising the emigrants, and then he's simultaneously enfranchising all these ethnic Hungarians in neighboring states, giving them citizenship and the right to vote. And guess what? He makes it very easy for them to vote. So the rules for Hungarian emigrants living in Germany are different from the rules for ethnic Hungarians living in Romania for instance. And for them, they can vote, you know, they kind of do a vote by mail, they make it very easy for them to vote, make it very hard for the emigrants. Yeah. Right. Um, and, and by the way, those people all vote for Fides, the ethnic Hungarians in neighboring countries who he has given citizenship to, and they're thankful, they vote 90% plus for Fides. Yeah. Uh, there's a question here from Brazil, from Antonio de Odilon Brito, and Antonio asks about Russia and Russian policy towards the European Union. Um, and it, it does throw up an interesting question between um, Russia's links to Hungary, for example, to a lesser extent to Bulgaria, certainly to Serbia within Southeastern Europe. Um, is Russian policy simply crudely about displacement and disruption and how successful do you think it has been? And the other side of that is about EU policy. There have been many people critical of President Macron for his attempt to reset relations with Russia just at the point when Alexei Navalny was poisoned. And Germany also seems to take a very soft approach to Russia, whether it's because of Nord Stream and other economic interests, uh, or, or, or other things. So perhaps you just talk about authoritarianism and the Russian sort of connection and how the EU engages with all of that. All right, well, uh, bom dia, Antonio. Boa pergunta. Uh, pergunta. Okay, so it's nice to have someone joining us from Brazil. And look, the Russian factor, it's a great question. It's been very important. Uh, and I, I, I've written one article on this with my colleague, uh, Mitchell Orenstein, who knows a lot more and has written a terrific book about kind of Russian in influence in Europe and the kind of competition in Eastern Europe. And let me start with that and then kind of come to the broader issues of France and Germany and Russia. So Russia views the EU and its kind of democracy promotion in the European neighborhood as kind of existential threat, right? Uh, we, and that's why, by the way, this idea that, you know, that like Joseph Borrell kind of saying, well, now we figured out that Russia really cannot be a partner and uh, that sort of thing. It's a bit ridiculous because Russia's made it clear for 10 years, right? That they view the EU kind of as a rival and they want to divide and weaken and undermine the EU. You know, they, for Russia, you know, they want, um, you know, a united Europe of 27 countries working together is terrible news for them. And to the extent that the EU then can kind of, you know, develop its uh, trade relations with countries like the Ukraine, these lands in between, as Ornstein calls it, you know, that's bad for Russia. So they, they, th that's the lens through which Putin sees it. And Putin has then been actively seeking to undermine the EU 
both through uh, supporting financially far right autocratic kind of and populist parties like uh, Le Pen's party, you know, Russian bank provided support for them. Uh, there's many examples, but also through cultivating uh, what we call sort of Trojan horse regimes within the EU. So he's tried to cultivate close warm ties with the Orban regime and to try to get Orban to promote Russian interests where possible in the council. And there's many examples of Orban doing just that, right? Um, so, I mean, I guess that's what I'd say about you know, Russia and the connection there. More broadly on the EU's stance vis-a-vis -vis Russia on the whole, yeah, I think it's incredibly disappointing uh, to see someone l like Macron talking about resets. I mean, this is not just a autocrat, he's a murderer, right? I mean, I don't know, how, how do you have a reset when you have to worry about whether he's gonna kill the people you send to talk to him? You know, so I think it's ridiculous. And Germany on Nord Stream 2, I mean, it beggars belief that they press on with this Nord Stream 2. The Biden administration is against it for obvious reasons. It, it um, it's a terrible idea, and uh, but but nevertheless, kind of the German political establishment seems to just keep doubling down and not be able to you know break away from this. Um, so uh, I think it's a big mistake, and I think you know the EU doesn't mean they shouldn't talk to Putin when they need to and, and things, but they should treat him for what he is, which is a, a rival and an adversary. Right. That brings us to. Uh, perhaps the final question, Dan, we've covered a lot of ground, but I'm very interested in what you've had to say about the Biden administration. And I note that I think it was yesterday um, there were comments from a State Department official about Bulgaria, which upset people in GERB and the Bulgarian government. Uh, it seemed to indicate that Washington might take a more forceful approach to governments that were deemed to be uh, you know, behaving badly, let's put it like that. Um, and, and the question is whether the Biden administration's arrival in office at this moment might be a game changer. What can the Biden administration contribute on Hungary, for example, on Poland in its engagement with the EU and you know, individually in terms of the people they appoint as ambassadors and the work they do on the ground in those jurisdictions? Yeah, no, it's a it's a great question. And look, the the Biden administration takes, of course, uh, it takes a hundred and eighty degree you know, opposite approach to these issues of autocracy and kleptocracy from uh, the Trump administration, who was, of course, you know, himself a kleptocrat and wannabe autocrat, right? Thankfully, failed, and who you know befriended and supported these kind of um, regimes around the world and kind of gave sucker to them. So, thank goodness. You know, we have a kind of uh, not just Biden himself, but the team surrounding him. You know, these are principled people. I mean, look look at um, you know the Secretary of State Blinken. He is very familiar with the region. Um, his um, you know, father, I think, was ambassador to Hungary at one point. You know, he he knows the score in the region, and he's got a great team around him who know the score also. Uh, I think, and they're very committed to promoting the fight against corruption and promoting democracy. You know, one thing we saw, I, did, I missed those Bulgaria comments uh, the other day, so I haven't seen that. But one thing I did see just the other day was a designation of a former prosecutor from Slovakia who had been engaged in high level corruption. I think, I don't remember the details. I don't know if they pulled his right to travel to the US or something, but you know, they, they kind of censured him. And that reminded me, if you go back, let's say in the Obama administration, there was a period under Secretary of State Clinton when a few Hungarian high level officials, yeah, again, were put on uh, uh, basically a kind of no travel list uh, because of their involvement in corruption, et cetera. So I would hope down the road, we might see more actions like that, right? From the Biden administration, uh, you know, uh, applying uh, those kind of tools to target corrupt officials, things like that, right? So I, I think there's there's now a big potential for those moves where there wasn't. There's also this proposal he has for a kind of conference of democracies, right? And, you know, I think right there, one big tool or question would be who you invite and who you don't invite based on whether you, you know, so I think a great start would be to not invite, you know, the Orban regime, right? Um, you know, so, uh but we can go from there. That being said, 
while the Biden administration can, and I think will do some things, ultimately the tools of the US are relatively limited on these issues in the European context compared to the tools of the EU. Uh, the, and I just end, I guess, if we're ending our questions with saying this, the, the EU has plenty of tools. They need to stop talking about creating new tools. You know, I often compare it, it's like to a do-it-yourself kind of home repair person who every time they see a new leak in their roof, instead of getting started fixing it, they, they kind of say, well, I need to go to the hardware store and buy some other spanner or something, right? No, you know, the EU needs to stop creating new tools and start using the ones it has. And are you optimistic that five years from now, 10 years from now, we may see the dial or the pendulum swing back towards pluralism again in Central and Eastern Europe? I'm torn, John, because, you know, I'm half Hungarian, which should make me a pessimist, but I grew up in California, which should make me an optimist, right? So what to do? Uh, I, I guess on balance, I am optimistic, um, but it, it, it's a close run thing. It's very worrying. Uh, the things that make me pessimistic are that we see this rot spreading, right? We see other regimes, uh, you know, taking uh, up this model and, and spreading it. On the optimistic side, you know, this move to push Orban out of the EPP, I think that's very important. It won't change things overnight, but I think there's kind of a growing awareness because until now, basically, you know, parties at the European level and governments like Germany's, they would support these pet autocrats and there was no awareness. Voters didn't know about it. No one cared. There was no price to pay. You know, I think now that there is a, over time a growing awareness of these problematic relationships and maybe some kind of mounting pressure on governments. You know, I don't know, you could tell us more about Ireland. I don't think there was much pressure on the Varadkar government, right? People didn't realize he's in the party with Orban. But I think the only, I guess I'd leave it in a kind of neutral phase where there's, you know, there's a, a mounting risk and there's a bit of a pushback coming at the same time. So which one gains the advantage, you know, we'll see in the next couple of years. And of course, it is people ultimately in these jurisdictions that will really matter. Uh, in the Romanian case, I think half a million people came out into the streets of Bucharest in January, just after the PSD came back to power, freezing minus 20 temperatures, hugely courageous people in Poland and in Hungary opposing yeah. regimes. And they need our support, I think, um, in all kinds yeah. of different ways. Yeah, absolutely right. And that, you know, in, in the case of Poland, you know, the, there's the opposition has been stronger and, you know, there's, you know, hope and, uh, you know, we'll see. But I think you're exactly right that, you know, ultimately, yeah, I, I, I don't think we'll see a series of hardcore authoritarian regimes consolidated in the region. I, I have hope that people will, you know, stand up and, and try to stop that. Yeah. Uh, just to remind uh, our viewers that, uh, we have further events in this series on the 24th of March. We'll be looking specifically at developments in Slovenia and the efforts of the Janša government to attack cultural institutions, to attack academics, to attack the media, to try and consolidate their own power. And we'll have Professor Florian Bieber and a whole range of excellent colleagues from Slovenia. And then on the 14th of April, we have a review of the Bulgarian parliamentary election with Dimitar Bechev, and with Professor Anna Krastova of the New Bulgarian University. So all of these events, I think, in some ways are linked, and I'd hope that people might join us again for those. But for now, um, it remains for me just to thank our speaker, Professor Dan Kellerman. It was just hugely illuminating and expansive, Dan, and we thank you very much for your insights and for your time today. I thank all of our participants as well for joining us. Um, I also want to pay tribute to our colleagues in Musi, to Anne Hamilton Black and Dorla Dunn for the great, great work you do. I know you were hosting another event today, so we really appreciate all the work that you do working with Professor Linda Connolly in the Maynooth Social Science Institute. So from us, it's goodbye. Thank you very much indeed, Dan, and see everybody next time. Thank you. Thank you.